everybody. Um, as I was telling my friend here, uh, I hail from the far, far away place of Prenzlauerberg, Berlin, 30 minutes by train. I'm from Vancouver originally. Um, I currently work at a company called Ivan. We do a lot with the Apache Foundation projects um, as a developer educator on the DevRel team. Um, and I'm going to do this just because I can see some people ducking in behind the pillars. So a bit about me. Um, I got my start in open source in probably like the weirdest way possible uh, in that I jumped straight in by working for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, I was hired as a technical writer to help out with the Kubernetes and the Cloud Native projects and to kind of just be a resource for those open source projects. Um, and so that was my first exposure to the fact that um, there isn't necessarily a lot of role diversity within a lot of open source projects. Um, and I was very lucky, and I think the Cloud Native community was quite lucky to have a dedicated resource for these things, but it was not the normal path. Um, from there, I went to Stripe for a pretty short period of time because I really missed open source and Stripe doesn't do a lot with open source. Um, but they were taking their first steps into that, um, that realm in that they open sourced their very famous documentation stack while I was there and that was a lot of fun to be a part of. Um, like I said, I would now work for Ivan. Um, Ivan is seeking to be everybody's open source data platform. Um, and for me, it was really about being with an open source aligned company. Um, talking a little bit about Ivan, like I said, it's a fairly open source aligned place and it's gonna be the framing for this talk around developing maintainer communities. Um, for a bit of background, this talk was actually originally created to give to folks at Mercedes-Benz. Um, and so I was really interested for that particular audience on how can companies and how can particularly like large organizations um, contribute to maintainer communities in a way that isn't just directly hiring maintainers. Because I think there's a lot of leverage there that you can do um, and a lot of things that you can do as a part of a company that are a little bit harder to do from other angles. Um, so Ivan cares a lot about open source. We kind of founded ourselves on a fairly robust um, Postgres backup tool called PG Horde. Fast forward nine years, now we do a whole bunch of open source. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit by the numbers. Um, Ivan has two GitHub organizations which it open sources things through. Uh, there are, in November, when I originally made these slides, uh, there were 39 projects in Ivan Open. That number has gone up since. There were 34 projects in Ivan Labs. That number has gone up since. Um, there are approximately 10 people on the DevRel and community team, all of who have varying levels of open source contribution. Um, there are about 19 full-time upstream contributors um, as hired by the OSPO um, in Ivan. There are additional contributors in our product organizations. Notably, we have a couple of our um, couple of people working on our open source pro our open search project are also um, maintainers for open search as a whole. Um, all of this is to say this is actually quite a few contributors and quite a few projects for a, an organization that's about 500 people large. Um, and while that is kind of a luxurious amount of people to work with, that does actually leave you with a number of, for all the things we have directly open sourced, there's about two to three projects per contributor. Um, so that's a bit of a pickle, uh, because community building is hard. Um, and wow, there's bottles happening back there. I'm very distracted. <laughs> um, community building is hard, uh, and we have significantly more projects than we have people to build communities with. So we need to sort of make some decisions about what's valuable to us and how to go about this in a sustainable way, or else we're all going to burn ourselves out. Um, not a new statistic. Um, most projects have a truck or a lottery factor of one, meaning if one person got incapacitated in some way or won the lottery uh, and quit working for profit, um, a project would fall apart. And I think if you look at Ivan's numbers, again, I think we're regarded as a fairly active um, open source contributor for a company and fairly invested in open source. Our truck factor is still one. So again, we've, we've got some problems here. Um, Really great statistic from uh, Tidelift's maintainer survey, which is that most maintainers actually want help, but specifically, the most asked for help that they have is with non-code tasks. So the things that rank highest are what they want help improving documentation, they want help with contributor experience, maintaining 
onboarding and maintaining new contributors, and they want help with marketing. Um, and finally, topic of the quarter, really. Uh, open source is a cost center. Everybody is tightening budgets on everything across the board. Um, it's leading to very interesting licensing changes. For example, HashiCorp's business source license after building quite a prolific community with it as an open source project. Um, we've all heard stories, I think, of entire OSPOs getting laid off um, in companies large and small. Um, there's less time and leeway given to part-time contributors because their hours are being asked to sort of drive towards cost center. So we got, we got some problems, everyone. Um, projects are really people constrained to begin with. Um, in addition to being people constrained, they aren't finding the kinds of people that they need with the skill sets that they need. And companies are financially constrained, so they're not really willing to dump more money into this problem. So, okay, how do you build a contributor community in that like milieu of garbage? Um, and sort of balance the fact that for a lot of us, we're working for companies that are trying to drive a profit. Um, and sort of how do you thread all of those needles? Uh, a very belated agenda of like what we're gonna talk about here and like the major points we're gonna hit. Um, first, we're gonna zoom out a bit. And we're going to ask ourselves, why do we open source things? So like I said at Ivan, we have these two GitHub repositories um, that we, or GitHub organizations rather, that we open source things through. And like, let's sort of look at it through a lens of why. Um, from there, I think we can start asking ourselves, where do we find the right kinds of contributors and sort of how can working for one of these companies that is engaged in open source help? Um, and from there, we can talk about how do we grow and retain contributors of all kinds. All right, everybody, let's dive in. So why open source? Um, I am not qualified to answer to this question, but let's do that anyways. Um, <laughs> so let's just review the open source at Ivan situation. So we have this split for a reason because it helps us have a bit of a mental split because there's all sorts of reasons for open sourcing something. Um, the things we open source through Ivan open, um, are things that we and our OSPO as a company have decided, yes, these are projects we care about. Yes, these are projects that we're trying to solicit and accept external contributions for. And yes, these are projects that, should they get enough traction, we are willing to put the effort of developing community into. Ivan Labs um, has a bunch of open source stuff that has a very different purpose. Um, so Ivan Labs primarily houses sample code um, as a member of the developer relations team, this is where the contributions of my team typically end up. Um, but we also have people in sales, we also have people doing webinars who are submitting sample code there, and other sort of more experimental things. Things can move from Ivan Labs into Ivan Open. Um, they don't typically go the other direction. For us, the value of open sourcing things through Ivan Labs is to have it out in the open. Um, it's not necessarily to accept contributions towards. It's not necessarily to actively maintain. Um, and it certainly isn't for us to necessarily develop communities around. And that's okay, because you have to focus your efforts. Um, and that's how we kind of manage it. Like, when you really slice it in half and you say, you know what, half of the things we're open sourcing, we're not trying to develop some robust, superstar, media-grabbing community around. It becomes much more manageable problems to solve. Because you say, OK, we're being really, really intentional about the things that we are open sourcing. Um, at Ivan, we kind of think about open source in three, three pillars. Like, when we open source things for ourselves through Ivan Open, we're thinking about driving development of technologies we're invested in. So a lot of what we have open source in Ivan Open are things like Kafka connectors. Um, we have a lot of upstream Kafka maintainers, but it's very, very valuable for us to maintain an open source connectors for things that we want our customers to use. Uh, and open sourcing that just sort of builds the community around it because, you know, if you're using Kafka and you want to connect to a service and we're the maintainers of that connector, maybe it also makes sense for you to go with your managed Kafka with the people who are maintaining the pipeline that you care about, right? Um, when we open source through Ivan Labs, our intention is to provide useful code to our customers to reduce repetitive work for ourselves and for others. 
and reasonably speaking, it's also to drive brand awareness. Um, the DevRel team sits under Ivan's marketing arm. Uh, we do produce a lot of code, particularly for our marketing arm. Um, but that's, that's my KPI, is driving eyeballs to the tutorials and guides that we write. Uh, and open source is a part of that because we can do things like attach Git pods to those, we can drive workshops off of those, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's, there's no point in closing the code in that scenario. Um, and finally, like, why do we support open source contribution a bit more broadly at Ivan? Um, and I do want to caveat this with, I'm not the lead of Ivan's OSPO. That is a person named Josep Pratt. He's very active both in Berlin's development community and in uh, ASF work uh, and in the to-do group. So I feel like I'm speaking on his behalf, and I just want to call that out. <laughs> um, we support, more specifically, uh, Yosef's OSFO supports um, open source more broadly at Ivan as a whole to support the projects that are business critical for us. So Kafka is open source th through the ASF. We're never going to own Kafka. That's not the point of open sourcing something through the ASF. But we've built a pretty strong business around it. Um, therefore, it's important to our bottom line that Kafka continues to be maintained, continues to be secure, continues to be actively maintained and patched, and it makes a lot of sense for us as a business to put some people full time behind that. Um, I personally am a, am a contributor to Kubernetes still. Um, that's less business critical for us, but we still do use Kubernetes and cloud native services. Um, it's important to Ivan that I have the leeway to do those things. So let's talk about why we shouldn't open source something very, very briefly. Um, I open sourced this to Ivan's Slack. Uh, so these are direct quotes which will not be attributed to any specific people. <laughs> uh, do not open source something because you hope that people will work on it for free. Uh, this is surprisingly common, particularly in large corporations, actually. Um, it's a bad idea. People aren't going to work for some, on something for free that you aren't willing to work on yourselves. Um, unless it's particularly useful. Um, open sourcing something for the sake of marketing. Um, I will caveat this with, like, with standards work, kind of, but um, if it's a marketing ploy, it's usually a bad idea. Um, open source requires a lot of work, it requires a lot of effort. You probably shouldn't put that kind of work and effort on an ongoing basis into a marketing campaign. Um, and finally, doing the old bait and switch. Uh, usually a bad idea. The point of this is to be intentional when you open source something, because if you're intentional when you're open sourcing something, it becomes very, very obvious what you should put effort into building community in. And community is a ton of effort. It's a ton of effort on an ongoing basis. It will never stop being a ton of effort. If anything, it will become more and more effort over time. So from a purely... Um, cutthroat perspective, you probably want to um, be very intentional when you start to build a community. Okay, let's talk about finding contributors. Um, let's highlight this one area of like why we should open source things, which is to drive tech interest in technologies that we're invested in. Um, I don't remember where I was going with this, so we're going to go to the next slide. <laughs> uh, so the background of this is I originally drafted this in uh, November for a presentation that I didn't give, so <laughs> I'm struggling, y'all. Um, okay, so let's talk about what actually needs a contributor community. Again, if we're intentional with what we're open sourcing and why we're open sourcing it, we've kind of found the answer for ourselves. Projects you're invested in long term for the sake of your business, obviously. Um, projects that can benefit from standardization across an industry or technical niche, or that help against the standard, for example, our Kafka connectors. And projects that exist as an alternative to a standard implementation or a functionality. Um, one of, um, actually two of Ivan's biggest open source projects, um, one is called Carapace, uh, and the other is called Claw, um, exists as alternatives to a schema registry um, put out by Confluent against Kafka. So, if for whatever reason you don't want to be fully bought into one ecosystem, it's really, really important to have alternatives. Okay, 
So where to find contributors? I think, when, especially when you think about this in the context of a for-profit company, you have two places. You have internal contributors who work for your company, and you have external contributors who don't. Um, internal contributors are fantastic when you can find them because they're like in your sphere of influence, and you can kind of just like siphon them in. Um, it is the single easiest way to have a stable and functioning open source project. Um, nobody has any money. Uh, however, hiring is the most important tool in this regard. Um, as a career technical writer uh, and not a developer, but also somebody who deeply loves working on open source and is very invested in this, my biggest question to you is, do you need to hire a dev? If we look back at that chart from earlier on in the presentation, most projects want help with documentation, they want help with community, and they want help with marketing. So why are you putting your headcount towards another dev? Um, if you're early project and you're trying to get more momentum, like fractionally borrow those roles from somebody else. But if you're a bigger project, um, especially for documentation, in my opinion, you really should consider spending some headcount on that. Um, two, where can you financially incentivize internally? Um, Ivan, and again, this is Josip Pratt's fantastic work, um, has an internal program called Plankton. We are very crab themed. Um, very ocean themed in general. So our internal program is called Plankton. It's our internal contributor program uh, where for the weekend dev or the evening dev um, who's contributing to open source in their own time, you can log your hours with Ivan and we will actually pay you at a certain rate for that. Um, and that's how I'm a part of why I contribute to Kubernetes still. Um, financial motivation is great because people like money. We live in capitalism. <laughs> Um, the third thing, and I actually think this is a really important one, uh, is where can you motivate people? Um, I think open source is a really great facility for developing people's skill sets, um, for developing people's careers, for providing people with the leadership skills to sort of move up in their career ladders outside of open source, um, and working with hiring managers and with your HR department to sort of build in open source contributions as things that can count against somebody's performance review for a quarter is a really powerful way to pull people in. Because then you can say, in addition to the thing you get from open source, you get this thing back. You get this thing you can put on your resume back. You get this thing that can like improve your performance review because you're learning those leadership capabilities that are actually really hard to learn in some fields outside of that. OK, external contributors. Um, Amazing if, again, you're trying to build sort of an external contributor community. Um, the lessons from here are from, um, actually from the open source community. So if there's anybody from open source in the audience, uh, this really comes from you and your interaction with Ivan. Um, the easiest way to sort of build an external contributor into something more is to look at people who are kind of submitting pull requests. Um, and then really start a personal conversation and then start a personal mentorship to sort of grow the role. Um, so an example of this, and their name slips my mind, is um, one of our open search engineers at Ivan um, contributed a patch to the open search security project because Ivan needed the patch for our customers. And of course, why not, op why not contribute that upstream? Um, and the wonderful people attached to open search at AWS reached out to him personally and really mentored him up to a point where now he's one of the maintainers of the open source security project. Um, and I think Ivan is actually, to this day, one of the only non-AWS maintainers there, and that's awesome. <laughs> um, but doing that very personally, especially if you're a smaller project, is like a really, really key thing. Um, the other thing I've seen work, this is like very much a big company game. Um, is establishing a partnership of organizations before you open source a project. I call this like the Kubernetes gambit, uh, because that's kind of how Kubernetes went out into the world. But again, that's, that's, an, that's a big company game with big company money and big company results attached to it. Your mileage may vary, dot. <laughs> um, OK, let's talk a little bit about growing contributors. Um, Kubernetes was famously three devs and a community manager when it first started, and now it's like the conglomerate that it is today. Um, the thing that I would take from that community um, is that build it and they come doesn't work when it comes to no-code co no contributors. Um, when you think about like what 
something like Kubernetes is, it's like a whole bunch of GitHub repositories um, and like very arcane sort of like you have to know how to fork a repository and sync your fork with an upstream which like I've been contributing to Kubernetes on and off for like four years and I'm still like not good at that. So like I still have to nuke my repository for Kubernetes website like every every like six commits more or less like because I've just like forgotten how to sync it. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is I, like, I know how to use GitHub. <laughs> uh, I still think I'm pretty bad at it. So if you're trying to attract somebody who is gonna help you with project marketing, you can't just say like, oh, just open a PR and it'll be on our blog. That's never gonna work with them. Um, you have to really be willing to kind of go the extra mile and sort of have a personal connection. So two things to think about from a more practical perspective. Think about roles and documentation, first off, and think about what processes do those roles need to be successful. Just like you would with any job application, working on open source is a job. If you think about it like a job, it's easier for people to plug into that framework. Okay, uh, near and dear to my heart, onboarding people to open source as a functionality. Um, this is especially important when you're dealing with people, again, who aren't developers and who haven't interacted with open source. Um, collaborating in enter enterprise does not equal collaborating in open source. Um, approvals and escalations are different. If you're, if you're used to working in an enterprise, you're used to being able to escalate to a manager, and then a manager's manager, and then up, up, up the chain if you know you can't get something approved. That's not how that works in open source for the most part. It's usually more bottom up. Decision making is different. Uh, people typically are waiting for you to propose a solution as opposed to give you a solution. Um, and again, when you're working with roles that are not developers, you need to reframe collaboration because that is not what they're going to be expecting and it's going to be really, really difficult for them to understand if you're not willing to put that extra effort in. Um, the second thing to sort of reframe is the idea that everybody in open source is a community manager on top of their real job. So I was having a conversation um, earlier outside with a few folks um, where I kind of had to explain that like technical writers are by their nature kind of um, shrinking daisies, like we're a little bit introverted as, as a field. Um, and sort of looking for people who can develop the skill set and really the people skills needed to become effective open source collaborators is hard. Um, and two is if you do choose to hire for some of these roles, you're not going to find people who have like a ton of experience in open source necessarily. You might just find people who have the experience that you're looking for. Um, and you're going to have to kind of select for the personality traits of like, is this person open enough? Is this person collaborative enough? Are they enough of a people person that we can mold them into the open source contributor that they need to be? Um, uh, Don Foster is not in the room, which is unfortunate, but Don gives a million good talks on the um, importance of good contributor letters. Um, this is really important too, especially if you're trying to like justify that contribution internally or build it into some sort of career ladder or performance review thing. Um, people need to see a progression from my first commit to my fifth commit to now I have commit rights for the repository. And what does that mean? Um, again, Dawn Foster gives some fantastic talks on that. I am, she is here, she has purple hair, you should look for her in the audience uh, and talk to her about this because I am not gonna do anywhere near the justice that she does. Um, finally, very important to me, a uh, huge lesson for my time at the CNCF, which is synchronous and asynchronous communications. Um, if you are having meetings about your project, if you don't publish those meetings on a website or a calendar, people are not going to be able to find them and they're not going to be able to attend. Um, I worked with probably 140 projects at the CNCF. That was the total when I was there. Um, and I, of the ones that came to me for advice, I had to tell this piece of advice to just about every single one. It is stunningly not obvious. Um, if you're a new project, your table stakes for a community is some sort of synchronous conversations so a Slack or a Discord, uh, and I would encourage you to have a once weekly office hours call because some people like to talk, talk. Um, and asynchronous communications, so things like email, GitHub issues, GitHub discussions, et cetera. You need both. You need to talk about the same things in both. <laughs>
Um, it is really important because people have different communication preferences, and the more you can cater to those, the better. Okay. Um, I'm going to zoom because I'm going to run out of time. Write the contribution docs. Um, if you don't tell people how to get involved or what specific things they need to do, they won't know how to do them. Where are your public comms? Where are your communication docs? It's not just the documentation for your project, it's how do you contribute to the project. Um, a really important one too is, for example, if I open a PR, um, how long is it going to take that before it gets merged? How many people need to approve? What can I expect as the contributor? Um, buddy up. Onboarding is easier with a friend. I mentioned this a bit earlier with the open search um, story. If you're looking to grow somebody, make the personal connection, because one of the most amazing things that can happen with open source is you can make friends, <laughs> which is really hard when you're an adult. Um, make the personal connection with people. Um, go on a wonderful journey. I, I'm the scarecrow, but <laughs> um, also realistically, uh, asking questions of maintainers is really scary because you're a stranger on the internet. You're probably really smart, um, and they don't know you. Finally, especially if you work for a company, embrace marketing. Um, so this is a case study we did with one of our open source projects major users. Um, projects don't grow on their own. Um, and you can very easily make use of existing frameworks within your sort of product marketing uh, organizations to help people understand that your project is well maintained, it's stable enough to deploy in prod and enterprise. Uh, TLDR, walking a tightrope is a thrill. Um, working in open source while working for a for-profit company is definitely a tightrope. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, and thank you for your time. I went super duper over. I apologize. <laughs> thank you, Celeste. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Thanks a lot. I find it very relevant to what I do and um, also a lot of uh, inspiring uh, points. My question is about, uh, as a, a full-time sponsor contributor for mm -hmm. uh, as a community manager, mm -hmm. sometimes I struggle with um, giving non-sponsor contributors time and space to uh, to contribute, to take over like leadership uh, roles in some projects at their pace, while I also I have different paces because mm -hmm. it's also my job. Like I'm paid for contributing, and uh, um, how if you have an experience like this, how mm, can I better organize myself to make sure that everyone has the same level of uh, possibilities that I have? while I'm also meeting my company's expectations? That is a really, really good question. Um, consider a shadow program of some sort. So for example, if you're a community lead, um, don't just ask somebody to be like, hey, you're the community lead now. Because yeah, they're going to want like a whole bunch of time to onboard to that, because it's a new job, basically. Um, whether it's their full-time job or not is immaterial. Um, so the way a shadow program works, uh, I'm bringing this specifically from Kubernetes, um, is somebody will go to all the meetings that you go to, do all the tasks that you do, but at a slightly lesser level. Um, so I happen to be shadowing documentation for the 1.30 release of Kubernetes right now. Uh, the docs lead for that release, um, make sure the branches are in sync, he makes sure that all the enhancements that are going in um, are opening their PRs on time. They make sure that they like know that they have to write documentation. They make sure that they don't need help with that. Um, and I take care of some of the smaller bits. So sometimes I'll be the person who does the branch sync, and sometimes I'll be the person who gives the updates. Um, and typically, at least in Kubernetes land, it's pretty common to shadow for one or two releases and then maybe do, maybe lead after the third release. Um, but Kubernetes will do the same for things like leadership of working groups or special interest groups, where they will tag along for a certain period of time. They'll contribute at a slightly lesser level. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. But I mean, it's onboarding, right? It's like a job. You wouldn't throw in a new employee to doing your job 
tomorrow. <laughs> Unless you were really desperate, in which case maybe you would. But <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, lot, Celeste. Thank you very much for listening to the to the talk. And the next talk is in five minutes. Thank you for attending.